Hello, welcome to uh, revving up the journey to Pwn to own Automotive 2024. So just a quick introduction into who we are. Um, I'm Alex Plaskett. I'm a vulnerability researcher, exploit developer at uh, NCC Group. And my colleague, uh, Macaulay, is also in the same team at EDG. So just a quick introduction into what uh, Pwn to own is. If you're not actually familiar with the competition, then it's a, it's a yearly vulnerability research competition held by Trend Micro, the Zero Day Initiative. And there's multiple different uh, versions of the competition a year. So you have Pwn to Own Desktop, which is the, it's the original Pwn to Own, which was focusing on things like web browser security, enterprise security, the kind of things which you find in corporate environments. Then you have uh, Pwn to Own Mobile, which is the, originally it was focusing on compromising mobile devices, mobile handsets. And, um, but they recently expanded that to be embedded targets. So things like routers, uh, printers, NASs, and so on are now in that. And then there is also the Pwn to Own Automotive, which is what we're talking about today, which is focusing on all things like automotive and vehicle security. Uh, the goal of the competition is to compromise a set of targets. You have to actually gain like full code execution, like fully, fully uh, get like, access to the target. Um, you can't just report vulnerabilities. The exploits have to work. Um, and also, the, the prizes are based on the level of difficulty which ZDI, the organizers of the competition, where, how they perceive whether a target is like, easy or whether it's difficult. And the prize money kind of scales by that. The, um, the, and also, ZDI as well. They purchase these vulnerabilities uh, and exploits, but there's nothing really shady going on here. It's, 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 it's there to improve their products and also to uh, provide to the vendors directly as well in the disclosure and uh, so they can fix the vulnerabilities. So the, the venue, the, this is just a quick side note. It was quite a cool venue. It was in Tokyo. And uh, it was a Tokyo big site. It was a huge event, and uh, it was cool to have a hacking contest like right in the middle of this, this, this venue. Um, so the targets then, you've basically got in the automotive competition, you've got things like the Tesla. There was lots of different uh, attack vectors for the Tesla, uh, a lot of kind of over-the-air type attacks, which you uh, could do against the Tesla, the infotainment system. And then we had uh, in-vehicle in in infotainment systems. So these, were, these are aftermarket head units. These are ones you install in a car which don't come in the car to start with. Uh, and that was one of the categories which we, which we uh, tried to compromise. You also have the uh, electrical vehicle charger category, which is also what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we went after one of the devices there and also the uh, operating system security. So these are operating systems which are used within the, um, within the automotive space. So things like automotive grade Linux, uh, like uh, BlackBerry QNX, and just operating systems which are used. So the, the rules, you have to gain full, uh, full code execution on the device. And it has to be unauthenticated. Yeah, you can't start from a, like a privileged position. You can't just do a probesk and, and gain, uh, compromise the target. You're allowed uh, three attempts. And you, so your exploits have to be successful within those, those three different attempts. And you also have 10 minutes per, uh, like per attempt as well. So you get 30 minutes in total for the competition. Now, one interesting thing about the automotive one is that the um, you can actually do attacks which require physical presence. Like if you're physically close to the, to the IVIs or the electro, uh, EV charges, then you can attack them like that. That's different from the other pwn to own competitions, where all the attacks basically had to just be across the network, uh, like uh, yeah, over the network. You weren't allowed to like, physically be there. And also hardware attacks as well. Um, you're not allowed to do hardware attacks in the competition. Like you can't open up the devices, you can't like solder onto the onto the connectors, do hardware hardware kind of stuff. Um, but you're allowed to do that for preparation to gain access to like the firmware images, to to understand the targets and find the vulnerabilities and so on. 
so these are the ones which, uh, NCC, which uh, my team did. We, we went after the Alpine Halo 9 uh, head unit, which we were successful on. We went after the Pioneer device, another head unit, which we were also successful on. Uh, we went after the Phoenix Contact Char-X, which uh, is a, is a, it's a part of an EV charger. And also the uh, Auto Maxi uh, charger, which unfortunately we just ran out of time on because we kind of got a limited amount of time to prepare for the competition. And we, and we chose our targets based on what we thought we would be able to compromise within the time which we had to prepare as well. So how do you go about like, doing this kind of research? Like, What do you actually need for aut the automotive uh, competition? Then we've split these up into like, building like, a basic hardware assessment, like a hardware laboratory, what tooling, what equipment, and so on we need for, uh, to do those attacks. Then there's safety precautions, because things like EV charges, they're high voltage, like you could electrocute yourself. It's not great if you do that. Um, and then the general approach, which is the approach which, over the years of doing pwn to own like what we've kind of refined is our, our, our way we approach things. So the, the hardware environment, or building up a hardware lab, it didn't really require any super high-end hardware equipment. Um, for for the for pwn to own so just basically having things like a soldering iron, hot air station, multimeter, a logic analyzer, oscilloscope, that kind of thing, all things you, which you would normally have if you were doing uh, hardware security research, and then having useful things like mic microscopes, having BGA socket tools to um, allow you to do like BGA, BGA socketing. Uh, yeah, and just some additional tools, but we didn't really use any like high-end, high-end hardware attacks or really expensive equipment as part of our research. Um, from a safety precaution perspective, then the the IVRs, the the car IVRs, they're quite easy to set up. You can just follow the the wiring guides, which the, uh, all the devices come with. Connect them to your benchtop PSU and power the IVRs up and test them. With the EV chargers, this was a little bit different because, as I said, they've got a high voltage component. And most of them worked with having a low voltage component, which runs the operating system, and then having the high voltage part, which uh, actually charges your EV vehicle. So what one of our colleagues at NCC actually did was they, um, they modified the charger. Well, they disconnected the hardware from the, the, the high voltage side from the low voltage side. But unfortunately, the device just didn't power up. It wasn't booting up at that point. Um, so there was obviously like some kind of uh, necessary connection needed there. Um, but what they did was they increased the physical separation. We kept the high voltage inside a plastic container and uh, removed, like, moved the low voltage side outside of that and exposed that so we could do uh, attacks on the, on the low voltage side components. The Char-X didn't really require any modifications because this was, it was like an embedded, embedded Linux device which was out, uh, like kind of separate, which I'll cover later on. And ZDI actually produced a, a detailed guide about um, how to safely, safely test the EV charges as well because they were having quite a few questions about these environments. So our general approach then, what, what do we do, always do as part of Pwn to Own? What, Origi like the first things we, we do is we take a target and we'll do some background research. We'll, we'll basically see what research is, is already out there, which is in the public domain. So we'll go through like previous vulnerabilities, previous vulnerab like research publications, and examine those and see what, um, what other people have done. Some devices, there's, there's nothing being done in, in, these, uh, in, in this space, so we're just starting from zero. But in, in a lot of cases, other people have published. Then we try to build a, like device visibility, so building a debug capability on, on the devices. Like, so it's not just a black box. Being able to inspect, uh, being able to decrypt the firmware, being able to do reverse engineering, we have to gain that capability. And also being able to debug on the device uh, to, see, to see if our exploits are successful and so on. We, we try to get that. Then we do things like attack surface mapping. We basically map out what is 
permissible by the competition, but within the poem to own rules, like what, what, what services are accessible, what is the network attack surface, and so on. And then um, we move on to the, like when we understand the attack surface, we can, we can start doing the bug hunting process. So that's the kind of code review, reverse engineering, fuzzing, all the kind of techniques which we normally use to find vulnerabilities. And um, then it, hopefully at that point, we've, we've got some vulnerabilities, we've got, our, we've, we've got, got things like uh, lots of different vulnerabilities which we've found, and we, we try to um, exploit them. So um, we move to developing tooling, automation, basically scaling this up and, and building repeatable testing across the environments. Uh, and then finally, we move to the exploit development phase. Now, the, the, the exploit development uh, and testing as well is, sup is super important because it's quite easy to go to, go to Pwn to own with an exploit and then just have it fail in the, in the ZDI environments because you haven't tested it enough. Um, because there might be a slight difference within the ZDI's like setup or some kind of weird, weird uh, like configuration difference. And um, yeah, so doing loads of testing is really important. Um, I'll now hand over to Macaulay to talk about the IVI section. Thank you. Okay, so on with the infotainment system. Um, we're going to cover the Alpine. So this is the Alpine Halo. Um, we're going to cover the attack surface of the Alpine, then look at the hardware and some of the hardware attacks we had to do uh, for the competition, and then move on to the actual software and the software vulnerabilities, etc. So this is what the device actually looks like. Um, and we have one here as well. So onto the attack surfaces. The IVIs have a huge attack surface, um, ranging from, for example, the Ethernet or any Wi-Fi or SIM, uh, cellular SIM connections. So here there might be some uh, external services uh, open that you can connect to and interact with. Um, you have all the driver implementations, for example, of the Wi-Fi chips, the USB protocol, um, Bluetooth, uh, radio, etc. And then these IVIs as well have uh, multimedia capabilities. So you can play your own videos, your own images, um, audio for, over Bluetooth or by a USB. And then all these different multimedia formats um, are supported as well. So there's loads of image formats that you've probably never heard of that are uh, supported. And all of this requires some sort of uh, file format processing, which typically contains uh, vulnerabilities and bugs. Then the IVIs also have lots of different applications on them. So some of the IVIs have uh, web browsers. Some will have hidden debug functionality. Um, they have typically their own OEM uh, applications, things like Spotify and so on. Uh, again, all these different app applications can have all these various different vulnerabilities. Uh, and finally, a lot of the IVIs also have some way of performing f firmware updates. This could be through a USB pen, or it could be through uh, over-the-air uh, download. And again, there could be vulnerabilities within these. So this Alpine specifically had uh, these services exposed. Um, the interesting one mainly was the DLT daemon, which was diagnostic uh, log and trace. So it was basically just spewing out uh, debugging uh, information. Uh, this DLT diagnostic log and trace uh, program is open source. So you can just download and um, run the receiver connect to the Alpine and it'll just dump all the login information from the Alpine, which is useful for debugging. So looking at the actual connectivity and peripherals of the uh, Alpine, you have things at the back like the HDMI, HDMI input and output. You have a CAN, bu CAN bus connection. You have uh, GPS. You have microphones, et cetera. Uh, but you also have two USB B ports. And these U two USB ports are in uh, scope for the competition because they are passed to the front of the car, so a typical user would have access to them. For the Alpine as well, you can buy extra devices which integrate with it. So for example, there's this uh, Bluetooth sound control device which connects over Bluetooth. You can buy um, a camera for like uh, when you're in reverse and it shows you the rear view camera. Uh, so there's quite a few other extra functionality that you can integrate with the infotainment system. So looking at the actual uh, hardware teardown of the device, there's two boards, uh, two BC PCBs, and they're sandwiched together, uh, on connected to interlinked. 
Uh, and the two main components on this is the processor, is a, a Dolphin IntelliChips processor. These are quite commonly found on uh, aftermarket IVIs. And then there's also an EMMC. And the EMMC contains the uh, firmware of the device. Uh, and in this case, it was actually um, in plain text. So our initial step before the hardware was to go on the vendor's website and download the firmware. But it turns out they encrypt the firmware. So when you download it from the website, it's encrypted. And there was no obvious way to decrypt it. So then we pivoted our uh, methodology to go down the hardware route. So if we connect um, to the EMMC using a logic analyzer, we can monitor and see the data that has been uh, read or wrote to the EMMC from the processor. However, this just lets us view traffic in transit and doesn't let us um, request all the data from the EMMC, which is what we want, because we want to dump the entire firmware from the EMMC. So at this point, as next steps are, we can either try to do in-circuit programming, where we try to beat the processor to the EMMC so that we can send it our own commands. And those commands would just be to dump all the memory from the EMMC. Um, or we can take the chip off the device and put it in a, a BGA socket reader and then dump the chip that way. Um, however, the, the hardware team NCC had the, um, it took a few weeks for the um, BGA socket to be delivered uh, to the colleagues at NCC. And we didn't have much time in, um, for the competition. So the route the hardware guys at NCC took was to basically solder and wire, connect the wires from the back of the EMMC um, to this SD sniffer. And then you can just read it like an SD card and dump the firmware like that. <clears throat> so that was the only hardware attack we had to do. Uh, the firmware wasn't encrypted on the actual device, so we could just um, dump that off. And now we've got the firmware, we can start actually looking at some of the software bugs, um, reverse engineer some of the uh, functionality that uh, Alpine implemented. So the first bug is a client injection in the car by uh, car functionality of Alpine. So car, car by car is essentially Alpine's custom function to change the boot screen on the device. So for example, if this Alpine is put into a BMW, you can just uh, put the logo screen as a BMW. So when it boots, it shows a BMW screen. And the way this works is there's a binary called update MGR, um, which scans for a particular di uh, directory on your USB pen if it's plugged in. And the code, if you can read that, it essentially um, gets, performs a SHA-256 hash of a file, uh, an image file on your USB pen. However, the way it does it is by running a, a system command called OpenSSL um, with the file name of the file you can control. And because it's using uh, the C system command, uh, there's a, you can do a command injection there and uh, run your own commands in your, within your file name. So this triggers on boot. Uh, it also triggers when you insert a USB pen, if that file exists. And you can also manually trigger it through the, uh, the settings. So if you have a malicious USB plugged into the device, every time it boots, so every time the USB is inserted, it will automatically execute your own code. So this is the command that runs in a normal scenario where you have this um, logo image, which is a H.264 file, on your USB. So the uh, SDA one is your USB, and then the rest is what you can control. Uh, and in this example, we are injecting, for example, a semicolon, reboot semicolon, and that'll just reboot the device. So by doing this, if you plug the USB pen in, it'll reboot the device. However, we want to do much more than that. So uh, but the issues were there were some restrictions on the file name. For example, you couldn't use a, a pipe character or an ampersand, et cetera. And the solution for this was to run a HTTP server and then um, perform a HTTP request to our server and then uh, um, evaluate, like, do, perform an eval on the response to execute that code that we re returned from the web server. So this is what it looks like as the file name. It's eval and then our curl request. And then here is the web server code, which essentially just runs a, a simple web server on port 80, and it re, uh, sends the text back of what we want to execute. In this case, it's um, running mount-l to get the USB pens uh, mounted file path. 
it then um, executes the binary telnet D from the USB pen itself uh, on port 23 and, uh, and executes bin SH. So when we insert that USB pen, it um, triggers the HTTP request and then triggers the code execution of telnet. And then we can just telnet and get root code execution on the uh, Alpine. So here's a video of that. <clears throat> so this is the um, USB pen. You have in a bin directory just a telnet D binary. And then you have this car by car functionality. And here you have the, the image file with the file name with the com command, uh, command injection in. And that will perform the HTTP request. So here, when I plug the USB pen in, it performs that HTTP request. And, and you see that here on the um, PowerShell. It triggers that. And then it should be running Telnet at this point. So then we can just simply Telnet into the um, Alpine and get code root code execution. So that was the first vulnerability we found on the Alpine. Um, but that was quite a shallow bug, and it was quite easy to notice. And we thought, because it's a competition, a lot of other competitors might find the same bug, might find that straight away. And um, you, you basically get less prize money if it's already known. So we went a little bit deeper into the code and tried to find a little bit more of a difficult one. Uh, and this was in the, uh, the firmware. Uh, how it handles the firmware. So I'm just going to cover a little bit on how the firmware encryption works and how the device does the um, firmware file parsing. So the firmware was only encrypted over the air or when you download it for a USB pen. But on the actual device itself, it's not encrypted. Um, and basically, the firmware has two files in it. You have a zip file and this file called collective sign info.dat. The collective sign info.dat file um, is essentially just a container image which contains sub files. So, for example, block one is this UDP uh, package signature file, block two is host info.dat, and so on. So, these uh, sub files are basically you've got an NRC SHA 256 signature, you have host info.dat, which contains partially encrypted data and partially uh, unencrypted data, and then you have another signature file. So looking at the host info.dat file, which is the most interesting one, um, you have the AES128IV in plain text. Uh, in this case, it was all zeros. And then you also have an encrypted block at the end of the file. So at this point, we were, uh, had to go back to looking at the firmware we have already uh, dumped to find what the encryption decryption keys were in order to decrypt this block. Uh, and again, in this update manager file, we found two hard-coded AES keys. Uh, using the, uh, the IV uh, of all zeros as well, we could then use these two encryption keys to decrypt that block and also decrypt other files on the f uh, from the firmware. So this is the file uh, after you decrypt that um, block. You can see there's a, a decrypt um, like magic at the start of the decrypted block. You have the zip password of the, the zip original zip file, which in this case is actually just 01234567. Um, you have the file name of the zip, uh, the creation date, and then a CRC code at the end. So once you unzip that zip file with that um, very secure password, you get these uh, files. So, you, so most of them are encrypted, but we can decrypt them using the, the decryption key we found out previously. And there's a couple um, plain text uh, files as well. So the rootfs.dat file just simply tells you uh, the file sizes. Because it's such a big file, they split it into two gigabyte um, subfiles. And it essentially just tells you how big each file is and how many there is and how it goes back together. And then versions.dat is simply just the versions of various parts of the firmware. So. Using all this information we've learned, using the decryption keys and how to parse those files, um, we then wrote a decryption tool to get the encrypted uh, firmware and decrypt it. So now, for the next firmware, we don't need to dump the um, EMMC from the hardware attack. We can just decrypt them on the fly. 
And this is just the second half of that. Um, so once we've done the decryption, I then um, append all those rootfs together, and then we can decrypt all those um, various things, such as the kernel, the root, the root file system, etc. So to summarize, then, um, the firmware uses AES128 for encryption. The keys were hard-coded in the binary. The IV was in plain text in the host info .dat file. There is multiple um, SHA-256 signatures, and the zip password um, was encrypted in that file, although you didn't need to decrypt that file. You could have just brute forced it because of how simple it was. So now you understand how the firmware decryption and the firmware files work. Um, we're going to follow on to the second vulnerability we found in the Alpine, um, which again was another command injection, um, this time within the, the firmware uh, handling. So when it processes the firmware from a USB pen, it tries to pro uh, parse the, those files uh, and it reads that host info uh, function. Uh, sorry, sorry, file from that function, uh, and then it um, passes the update package. Now, within this uh, read host info, it decrypts the block, and then it copies the zip password from that file into this package info pass, uh, password structure. This is later on passed into this uh, function, which is passed to the, the decompress function. And at this point, you have to keep in mind that the password file um, can be controlled because we are able to recreate that um, firmware. We, are able, we have the encryption key, so we can recreate the encrypted part of it. And we can essentially create a fake firmware, um, although there is a signature checking. And then this password eventually gets passed to this um, system command, which just performs 7-zip to unzip the zip file with the password that we can control. And again, because it's past the system, we can just, again, do something like semicolon, reboot semicolon, and get code execution. But the issue is some of the update files are signed. Um, so if we did modify them in any way, then it would break the signature, and then it wouldn't reach this step. So the next issue was how do we bypass the signature verification? Well, luckily, there is. Um, some code already there by Alpine which lets you bypass the signature verification if a particular file exists. Um, so looking at the is UDP file exist function, it gets the UDP file's full name and then checks if it exists. And this, um, they tried to hide it a little bit by hard coding the string um, using XR encryption. Um, but once your XR decrypts that, you get the string of false update.bin. And then towards the end, you can see it just checks if that's on the root of the USB, which we can control. So as long as we have this false update.bin file in the root of our USB, our USB, we can skip that signature verification, uh, create our own firmware to a point, uh, and then trigger that command injection. So again, another tool we had to write was just to create this fake firmware file with the uh, password of, in this case, it does a semicolon. It um, changes directory to the um, directory on the USB pen, and then just executes a binary called D. Um, it also needs to update the CRC check, because the CRC check is still checked. But the signature verification doesn't happen because of that bypass, because of the false update.bin. So once we've modified that host info dot dot, this is what it looks like when it's decrypted. Uh, this af obviously, after this step, we encrypt it um, so that the device can read it. And this is essentially just what the um, USB pen looks like. So we have the update file. We have an, an empty zip file, um, because it doesn't actually need to be able to unzip it. And then we have the collective sign info dot dot, which we've modified and customized with that command injection. So to trigger this on the actual device, we just go to setup, uh, about software update, software version update, connect to the USB, and then press OK. And it will trigger trying to perform that update. But before it gets to the update part, it will trigger the command injection, and we'll get code execution. So that's the um, way we use for the actual competition to get code execution. But we wanted to do a bit more than just show a, a root shell 
Um, and we just wanted to make it a bit more interesting for the competition. So we thought, can we run Doom on it? Um, and in hindsight, this probably took more time than finding the vulnerabilities themselves. Um, but it was an interesting side quest. So the very first issue we had to um, figure out was how do we control the screen? And I spent quite a lot of time trying to intercept the existing communications, updating the screen, um, until eventually I figured out I could just kill everything, and then the frame buffer would let me control it. So then, once I stopped all the um, apps which were running on the device from running, which interacted with the uh, screen, I could then just uh, cat dev random to the frame buffer and control the screen. So at this point, we're able to control the screen um, to put whatever pixels on we want. Um, but then, how do we get Doom running? So there's this open source project called Doom Generic. And this lets you basically implement a few functions. And once you've implemented those functions, you can get Doom running on pretty much anything. Um, we also use the FBG library just to make it a bit easier to work with the frame buffer. Um, yeah. So the draw frame function is actually pretty simple in hindsight. Um, you just basically, the, the Doom uh, open source repository gives you um, the Doom data, which is a, the pixel frame buffer. And then you just map that and clip it to the screen's image. Um, and so the, the, at this point, we have the visuals of Doom running, but we don't have any way to interact with Doom. Um, so then we, the only way you can interact with it on this device is by touch screen. Uh, and there's a dev, uh, dev input touchscreen zero. And when you read from this, it gives you uh, the Linux input event structure. And this lets you track, for example, touching up, down, um, and touching X and Y coordinates of the device. Um, and at the minute, I only implemented it for a single touch. So you can use a single touch, and it will let you trigger where you're touching on the screen. And then I just simply mapped out areas in co programmatically of for example, if you touch the right-hand side, it will look right. Um, you touch the middle, it will shoot, and so on. So now I'm going to attempt a live demo. You can see that. OK. So we're going to set up system, and then go down to software update, update. Press OK. The USB pen is already plugged in, and this should trigger it to run our custom code. <laughs> I've just noticed, I think it's mirrored the opposite around, so apologies if it's backwards. So at the minute, it's loading all the um, various things into memory. Um, so it's a little bit slow loading. Um, but once it's in memory, it should Execute fine. So at this point, we can touch and load Doom. And then just by touching, we can <laughs> shoot and play, play Doom. So yeah, that, uh, we did manage to get that working in the competition, which was <laughs> nerve-wracking at first. But <laughs> yeah. Um, so in terms of patches, this was the statement uh, ZDI released. Um, and essentially, Alpine determined that the vulner vulnerability is classed as sharing the risk. Um, so they, haven't, they decided not to release a, a, a patch. So if you have an Alpine aftermarket head unit, you can replicate this and get Doom running on yours. Um, so now onto the EV charger and back over to Alex. Thank you. So yeah, just talking about the, the EV charger then. The, the EV charger which we were looking at, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like a residential charger. It was quite different from the ones which you normally see in people's homes where they'd be using uh, to, charge their, to charge cars and um, so your, so your driveway. We were looking at the Phoenix Contact Char X Sec 3100. And this was basically, it's, a, it's just an embedded Linux device. And it was a part of the EV, like part of building an EV charging infrastructure. 
So you'd essentially have the, the, this embedded Linux device, and you would connect it to the different components within the EV charger, uh, like to build your own kind of EV, yeah, EV charging um, infrastructure. So you'd connect the cables, the, the charger cables, and you'd also connect the, like the power distribution leads and so on. But it would be more used in, like, a, I, I guess, like a, um, like a charging park or managed by like a charging point operator. So the, from an attack surface perspective then, uh, how do we analyze this? So the first thing we looked at was the physical interfaces. We were like, what can we plug into this device? What can we, uh, what can we physically interact with it? Then we looked at this concept of device state. Now this was kind of novel for the Charex. It was uh, whether the device was in a client or whether it was in a server state. And then finally, the external services, like what can we do over the network? How do we attack it over the network? So this is what the Charex Sec3100 looks like from a physical interface perspective. You have a SIM card slot, which is used for vehicle-to-grid connections. You have microSD. You have a USB port, which is used to configure the device, which gives access to a kind of admin interface. And then you have two Ethernet ports. You have one for WAN and one for LAN. The there's this quite novel concept on, on the device, which uh, we found by reading the documents like on how you actually set the device up. It's got um, a server mode and a client mode. So you can have it configured in a server mode, and then the server can manage multiple different clients which are configured, which are daisy chain connected via Ethernet to the, to the server and push out kind of configurations to, to their clients. But what this actually means is it means that there's different services exposed, whether the device is in the server mode or whether it's in a client mode. And it also means that there's different communication mechanisms. So outbound, the network, network packets which are in, uh, sent from the device are different, whether it's in client or server mode. You'd also, so from an attacker perspective, what can you do then? Um, well, if we want to switch the device from server to client mode, all we need to do is run a DHCP server on a specific port range, the 192.168.4 range. If we advertise DHCP on that, we can go from server to client. If we want to go back again, like there wasn't, I don't think there was intentionally a way of doing this, but we found a, what is probably a vulnerability where we could change a configuration setting by a, via a REST service, which would change the system name to EV3000, and it would switch the device back from client to server mode. So this is what the, the services look like. We mapped out all the network ports and what the, whether they're accessible via the WAN, whether they're accessible via the LAN, and whether they were, in, whether that were, they were available in um, server mode or client mode, and came up with this table. So you have like normal things like SSH, like normal services like open SSH running on there. You have Mosquito, which is quite common for MQTT. But then you have a bunch of uh, services which Phoenix Contact have written themselves, custom services which are listening on, on custom ports. So we were like, oh, these look pretty interesting then. We should maybe analyze these custom services and see what, see what Phoenix Contact have done. They, they have, uh, they've got a website running on port 80, which is the admin interface for the charger. Then there's also a REST, a REST endpoint, a REST API point where you can communicate with. This is actually documented within Phoenix Contacts guides um, because it's like build your own charger. They want people to, like developers to, to interact with it. But then there's, there's other services running on, on ports which are totally undocumented. So we had to reverse engineer those to figure out what was running on the, on the other parts and what their attack surface was. So reverse engineering, this, we, did, we approached this from two angles. We did static reverse engineering, so just uh, decompilation of the binaries. And the binaries were quite interesting because they were written in Cython. It was uh, basically, it was uh, Python which gets compiled to C and then C to binary which made the reverse engineering a bit, a bit harder than it needed to be. The, then there was also dynamic analysis. We wanted to run it under QMU to see what we could find out as well. So the reverse engineering, Cython, if you've never heard of it, it's basically a, a way of translating Python code to C and C++ 
and um, providing a method of calling C functions, exposing types, and so on to the Python and class attributes. But what this actually means is it means that when you uh, compile it, then it generates a, like a load of boilerplate code, a load like a load of um, like wrapper code essentially. So essentially, one line of Python code is like 50 lines of C. And that kind of makes the reverse engineering process a little bit painful because there's just so much going on. It's not like obfuscation or, or packing or something like that, but it just makes it a bit more tedious. So one line, it, one line like hello world in Python is like 4,000 lines of C code. And then, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Uh, but it makes, it's, hard, it's hard to reverse, but not impossible. So this is what um, compiled Scython looks like. Uh, when we've applied our Ghidra script. So we, we wrote a Ghidra script to, uh, to, to uh, enhance the decompilation process. So it does things like finding and retyping symbols by using the open source uh, Python implementation and Scython. It retypes function signatures to make it more readable. Uh, it takes things like the string table, adds them as comments, and uses uh, yeah uses the string table to add more type information to make to make the disassembly a lot more easy to understand uh, the decompilation a lot more easy to understand. So at this point we were like okay now we can reconstruct the the string we can reconstruct what the Python looks like and what the variables and so on are, are. like this is probably enough to find vulnerabilities within the, within the code base. It might not be a perfect representation, but it's enough to work with. Um, we moved on to the, to the emulation, because originally we didn't have uh, the physical device. We had to ship the device, and it took time co in coming. So we were like, OK, we'll take the firmware image, and we'll try emulate it under QMU. And it was basically just a QMU. There were basically QMU 32-bit binaries. So we could, do, we could unpack the firmware image, the SquashFS, ch root into the SquashFS environment. Uh, run a shell under that, and, in, and uh, due to the magic of QMU bin format, we can uh, emulate the, the ARM32 binaries and, uh, and see what's going on, because it's just an embedded Linux distribution under the hood. So when we did this, we were like, OK, well, we can emulate binaries, but we don't really have a working Charex. We need to build our own Charex. So we're like, OK, we'll just copy the config files from the device. Uh, edit some config files, uh, maybe add some more debugging instrumentation so we can have more verbose debugging, and start the services running. So we wrote a, a script to basically run that. That gives us a semi-working environment without actually physically having the device, and we could examine it for vulns. So the vulnerabilities, them, so the vulnerabilities which we used then, um, it's essentially uh, executing a shell script with, um, which allows you to do the um, via config injection, but we, 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 so we start off with the device in server mode. We upload a, f a file into, uh, like we upload arbitrary file contents onto the device. Then we switch the device to client mode, and we exploit. We we configure the cellular network by changing some settings in there. We perform an injection in a PPPV, which is a native uh, daemon running on the on the device. And then we re reboot the device again. And um, at that point, we gain code execution. So there's quite a few stages within the chain. The, the uploading of arbitrary file contents, well, this is just we, we do a post request to the device to return database endpoint. Um, and they stored the contents within a .db file. But weirdly, they allowed an executable permission for some reason. Like They just set this database with executable permission, which was pretty convenient when we wanted to execute a, a Shkall script. Uh, there was some validation on the file name, but there was nothing on the file contents. So that was like arbitrary file upload, like arbitrary file contents upload. But we, we, we don't have our script executing at that point. Um, so what do we do? We just place a file on the file system, which, which uh, either changes the password or does a light show. Uh, so this is to demonstrate the code execution. We trigger the server to client mode switch by advertising a DHCP server on that port range, which I mentioned before. Then we do our config injection by 
Uh, so once we're in client mode, we, we, we're in, we do a config injection to a port which is only accessible in client mode. We set, a, we set some configuration values within the uh, cellular network section. And that gets uh, put into etc. PPP HRX providers file and used by the PPP daemon. And uh, so we, we were looking for like config injection here. We were like, okay, maybe we put a new line in. That wasn't allowed. But we could put spaces in, and spaces was enough to uh, to to perform our config injection because PPP it passes uh, multiple options on the same line as long as you uh, put spaces between them. So that was cool. We're like, okay, we'll read the man page. What, what do we do now? Um, and in PPP, they've got the ability to run scripts. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. That you can use it in it, in it, or you can use connect, and then uh, and then basically pass a script file. And because we've got arbitrary upload, we just pass our script file name to that. Uh, so this is what we just post to the endpoint. We set our cellular network idle disconnect parameter, which is vulnerable to injection. And we extend on that with a space, and then welcome, and then the script file path. And then that will basically give uh, the script file. Then that will basically should trigger the script file execution. But it wouldn't, because we needed to restart PPPV to actually um, get the script file to execute. So we're like, OK, how do we, how do we get um, PPP restarted? Well, if we switch the device back into server mode, we can do that, because we've got a vulnerability to do that. And we can also reboot the device, because there's an endpoint to do that. So we reboot the device, and then that way um, our script will execute when the device is rebooted on, uh, on restart. So this is just a demo of the, of the exploit running. <clears throat> so this is, um, we're starting off with the device in server mode. Then we're performing a, the arbitrary file upload while it's in server mode. Then we're switching the device to client mode. We're um, doing our, uh, the device will reboot in the client mode. Then we're, a REST service endpoint has started. We're posting to the REST service endpoint with our config injection. We're triggering the config injection. We, we're triggering the reboot. And we're demonstrating a light show. So if you look at the top, if you look at the, the top right of the device, you can see a pattern now going on, a light show happening. Um, to, to blink the LEDs. The reason we did that was because at Pwn to Own, we've got, we're constrained by the time limits of the competition. We could have, we could have like, done SSH, but we were running out of time. Um, or we, well, we weren't sure it was going to execute within the time constraints of the competition. So we did a light show just to demonstrate the proof, like to prove that we had arbitrary code execution. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> So to wrap up, this was two CVEs. There was uh, one about the arbitrary file upload, uh, and they fixed that. Then there was a second one to, uh, due to the missing author authorization functions being for a critical function. Um, but we had some failures. Like it wasn't like it wasn't always plain sailing within Pwn to Own. Like people, when they do talks, they're like, "Yeah, we did this. We did all this stuff," but they don't really talk about their failures. They don't really say what went wrong. Um, in the process, we, we bricked one of the IVRs, the, one of the Alpines. We had two devices, which was good. But the first one, we, we were trying to reball a BGA chip. And uh, yeah, the, the, it just wouldn't, um, we just couldn't get it reattached. And it wouldn't, well, it wouldn't boot up after we'd reattached it. So we were like, OK, we probably fried it with the hot air. Um, yeah. the, and, then the, and then the hotel device, um, we also had a problem with that as well. We, we think we corrupted the flash when we were doing the hardware attacks. So just kind of showing that you should have multiple devices when you're doing like physical hardware attacks as well. So at the end, the, from what conclusions can we draw? Well, all the EV charges were hacked. They were like fairly simple bugs. Like this wasn't any kind of crazy memory corruption chains. These were fairly simple bugs, but we chained them together with multiple steps in the chain. The, there were other competitors who, who had like slightly com more in-depth bugs, but on a whole, EV charger security wasn't really there. The automotive competition right now is quite accessible for people. If you're trying to get into doing pwn to own then this is a good competition to, to analyze the devices be, uh, to start off with. It didn't take as much time as, say, doing browser exploitation, which I've done in the past. And 
it's like many, many months of effort. Um, we've got research access is pretty challenging and needs to be done safely. So I just want to say thank you to, ever, uh, to ZDI, to Phoenix Contact for patching things quickly, and the NCC team, who is great to have lots of uh, resources to draw, to draw and like hardware skills and so on. And hopefully Mullis won't kill me for this, but we're also recruiting as well. We've got a lead, we're looking for a principal security researcher, vulnerability researcher, exploit developer um, to work in our team. Thank you. Thank you. All right, a couple of questions that we get. Thank you very much for the talk, extremely interesting. So I'm going to just, you got actually quite a, a list of questions. I'm going to go for the first two, um, the most upvoted ones. So one is, um, when you do research, how much time do you actually spend in this automotive? How much time do you actually spend setting up, getting hardware, dumping firmware, versus finding the vulnerability and exploiting it? Yeah, so a lot of time is spent um, doing the actual setup, configuration. Understanding the devices takes a lot of time, especially if it's a device which you've never like, seen before. Um, and it, it really depends on whether we've got previous background in, previous background knowledge on actually on the targets and, and whether other people have done research. If it's from zero, then it could be a long time to do that. It, it also depends on the, the device uh, itself as well, because like, for example, the Chartx, you could download the firmware from their website, and it was unencrypted, and you could just straight start, get straight in, started away. Whereas, for example, the Alpine, you had to start doing hardware attacks. That's a bit more time consuming. And then some of the other devices, like the Sonos, uh, Sonos even more time consuming. So it very much depends on the device. But. All right, thank you. Uh, just please maintain a lower volume in the, the wife. Thank you. Uh, second question is, um, why is network implemented on a car audio stereo, and how do you manage to connect into a network with it? So I believe uh, the reason networking is implemented is because there's a browser on there, um, yeah. because yeah, there's a there's a yeah. So um, you can there's, I think there's two ways on some of the IVIs. You can connect them to a hotspot, so like for you, for your, to connect to your phone, um, so then they can share the uh, internet connection with your phone, so you can stream things like Spotify, um, use the web browsers. Um, but they, uh, from memory, they also let you connect to the phone as well. Uh, sorry, to the IVI from your phone. Um, if it's, for example, got a cellular uh, SIM card connection. Um, but yeah, again, it's for things like the, the web browser. Um, quite it's application wide. specific. Basically. Yeah, application specific. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.